If you were just here for um, the previous talk um, and you see some slides that looks uh, similar at the beginning, that's only because Adam stole them from me. <laughs> Not the other way around. Shamelessly. Yes. All right. So, uh, as he said, uh, in other words, if you are here for the talk about, uh, don't put it on the homepage, you're in the right place. So, uh, quick thank you to all our sponsors here at GC Triple, Twin Cities Triple Camp. I uh, will just give a quick introduction about myself. So, I'm Dan Moyarty. Uh, I've been working on the web for a super long time. Uh, I, I've worn many, many hats over the years from uh, being uh, everything from a writer to designer, uh, both print and web, uh, as a web developer, user experience specialist, digital strategist. I've been a lead organizer of this camp uh, uh, since 2011. And on uh, Drupal.org, as well as what I'll always call Twitter, I'm Minneapolis, <laughs> Minneapolis Dan, which uh, coincidentally is where I live. Let me get uh, my time notes up here. There they are. Keep us on schedule. All right. So my day job is running, uh, working for and running a web agency called Electric Citizen. Uh, we've been working in the civic sector since 2012. We're uh, off a full suite of services. We're a team of Drupal specialists. We're really uh, uh, happy and proud to uh, sponsor this camp every year. And um, yeah, so uh, let's jump into today's topic. So a quick show of hands. I just wanted to get a sense of the room. Who here uh, feels good about their current homepage? A little about yeah, about a third of the room, and then some some half and half, and uh, just uh, out of curiosity, who enjoys working with their site today? About, about the same same number, okay. Um, for those who uh, and then oh, and I don't have it up there. Oh yeah, I did have it up there. So if you don't like your current homepage, or even those who do, hopefully we can either way we can get to, through some new tips and insights that you can bring back to your team. So what is this talk about? Making it's all about making a better homepage for your website. I, I, now that there's a mic here, I feel compelled to like lean into it, which is which is great for hearing. But then I'm like, I can't see my notes, so I'm gonna step back here a bit, um, and hopefully you can still hear me. So making a better homepage, you do this through um, better user experience, better design, more strategic use of content, and to get us thinking about a better user experience. Oh, sorry, I'll back up a second. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about why the homepage specifically that I'm talking about today. Um, and then we're going to get into areas that things can go wrong. I have a, a series of, of fictional monsters to, to share with you. And then, um, and then ways we can make things better. So to get us into thinking about a better user experience, I started thinking of it in terms of uh, obviously, we have these web pages, but in thinking in terms of actual physical spaces, and let's look at some rooms to get into that mindset. So, um, think of a living space. The last time you stayed or visited some place where everything was ordered and purposeful, and made it—it it was just clear where to go and what to do. So, maybe your place looks like this. Um, mine does not. Um, I, I've stayed at Airbnbs that look like this, and <laughs> maybe that's the the model, but. Um, just to, to kind of to go with me here with this sort of abstraction, you come into this room, you, you, you have a clear destination, a clear sense of purpose. I can come in and I think the primary call to action there is sit on the couch. And then maybe a secondary is sit on the weird little furry stools. And then <laughs> maybe a third is, is you sit and you play the game on, on the coffee table. But the point is there's, there's, there's a sense of clarity to the space. And similarly, if you go into um, this fictional coffee shop, you you don't need that much signage, right, to tell you where to go, what to do. It's it's sort of clear. There's a clear path to your place to order. Um, there's some secondary content in terms of like, oh, I could go sit over by the plant wall, or I could, um, you know, they have their their menu isn't isn't stated explicitly, but you know, you can visually see a sampling of their content when you got up there. And then uh, just a few more here. If you uh, are visiting from out of town and you stayed in a hotel, 
You go to a hotel lobby, again, you don't need a whole lot of instruction to know what to do. There's, it's usually designed to guide you to that primary purpose, which is the front desk where you can get help. Hotels often have a lot of other content, if you will, that you could experience. They could have an exercise room, they could have a dining space, a pool, but they don't try to usually, the good ones anyway, don't tell you about that the second you walk in the room. You don't have to look at like 10 things all saying, go here, go here, here's all the stuff we have. They start with that primary purpose and then from there you can guide off to secondary concerns because really they know what they've made a decision this is your primary thing is to get help get checked in okay so let's look at some rooms that aren't maybe as organized uh, I start with this one <laughs> maybe this is a room in your house hopefully not <laughs> um, but in, in terms of uh, different sort of user experience think of a grocery store so I don't think anyone goes into a grocery store for the first time and would know exactly where to go, what to do, right? It's a sort of a learned experience. You have to kind of be trained in it because there are so many options, there's so many directions, there's so much content, and there's signs everywhere vying for your attention. And so there's not really that, that clear user path to take other than to just go row by row. But if you're looking for something in particular, it could be anything. So there's not that primary message. And so, again, we learn how to navigate, but it's not an intuitive experience. And lastly, I thought of an antique store as a good example. So that's a space that I think is in general pure chaos. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the fun. I think people like that. But it's hard to gauge the primary purpose when you go into an antique store. There's not a top call to action. It's there to explore and have fun. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you are a government site or higher ed site or any number of uh, businesses, it's not, hey, hope you find what you need and have fun looking around. You're there to, to guide people to a destination. So we're talking about physical spaces so far and how that might uh, affect the clarity that you have in what you're supposed to do next. And so what I'd like to do is keep that in mind as we go into the virtual world. And are those, what do those spaces remind you of? So let's move over to the web. This was, first one's a real site, but it's kind of here as a joke. But this is, a, I don't know if you've seen this, if you Google like bad web design, this will show up. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, the best I can describe it is it's, it's a Norwegian version of Craigslist. Um, it's an overwhelming amount of choice and content. You have no idea where to start or where to go next, right? So um, it's more your antique store model versus maybe the coffee shop or, or, or what have you. But how about this one? So this is a popular site, popular company, and it's a design-focused company. And so I don't think it's a bad-looking site, but when you're thinking in terms of um, primary purposes, start with the navigation and look at how many choices there are. I think I, haven't, I didn't count them, but there's like at least a dozen. And what are you asking me to do here? And, and what effect does that have on the user? Is this, is this are you giving me a, a clear starting point or not? So if you scroll down the site, the content just goes on and on. I kind of broke it up into screens, but you can see here on the left and right. Um, it's good that they chunked it out and had space. And I get that they have a lot of content, right? But we, look at if you go to the drop down menu, and again, it's just, it's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of choice, right? So again, if you want to spend the time kind of wandering around looking for what you might need, great your average user to your website is there for two to three seconds and then they're out. So they're not necessarily there to, to just wander the halls. So another example, um, not to pick on anybody in particular, but this was an example of a, of a, a state site where, again, I think the design is fine. It's not bad looking. I like the colors. I like the photos. Um, but there's so many links. There's so many choices. So if you look at what you pull in in a single screen, you've got at least eight links in this bar here at the main navigation. 
Each of those has a drop down. You've got a secondary navigation here at the top, another six to eight links. You might think, oh, here's my primary destination, but that's just one of 10 slides that you can go through. And then you've got five more tabbed series of contents uh, along the bottom. And so the, again, the overwhelming feeling is, is, is you might be a bit lost. So what do I think users want from a homepage? They want clarity and they want purpose. Show me what I want to see, have the content I want, and make it easy to find and understand. So a lot of that relates back to your content creation itself and your design decisions. Um, users aren't looking online, generally speaking, for that antique store experience. They're looking there to check in, to buy the coffee, and move on. So they want to know they're in the right place. They want a sense they can trust you, and that's built. The trust is, is built many ways, but one way is through a clean, clear design and, and con content that is understandable. Um, they're, they're there to skim text in general. They're not there to, to read a lot. So with that lesson in mind, let's uh, begin our quest to finding a better homepage. And I'm, I'm going to start by asking a few questions. Why, why sh does this matter? I've kind of explained this to a degree, but I'm just going to hit that point again. And then again, we're going to look at where things go wrong and how to make them better. Right, I'm doing great for time. So, first point, why should you care at all? So, um, obviously you're here, so you, you, you care about something, um, but uh, presumably all of you have something to do with your organization's website uh, in, some, in some capacity, right? And so the purpose of your site and the homepage, what does that say about you, about your organization, and who is it for? And what I wanna emphasize even though it might sound obvious, is you are there to serve your audience, your customers, whoever the site is for. It's generally speaking, as a rule, a site is not there for your internal team. You might have an internet, and that's great, but if you have a public facing site, it's for that external audience. And again, that might sound obvious, but it is so common to see sites that end up being there to serve multiple stakeholders, including that internal audience, and all that does is add to the chaos and clutter of a homepage. So um, think of the, you know, this is the front door to your site and your chance to make a great impression. So uh, why the homepage itself? It Because uh, clearly not every visitor to your site starts at that homepage. Well, we know this from from research, from analytics, that that's not always the place that they start, but it's inevitable that so many of your users will end up there. It's important because it's always one of the most trafficked pages. It, every page on your site should uh, almost always have that link back to the homepage. It's a safe place, it's a touch point. I don't know where to go next. I'm gonna go to that homepage to find out what my next steps are, and hopefully your site is telling them. So. It's oftentimes the only chance you get to engage with a user too. Um, if they get to your homepage and they don't like what they see or they can't understand it, they're just gonna leave. So those are some reasons I think is important. I like this quote from a UX professional with the Nielsen Norman Group. A well-designed homepage should guide users towards their goals with clarity and precision while effectively reflecting the brand identity and the site offering. And the emphasis in bold there is mine. Uh, again, clarity and precision. You're saying a lot about your brand and what your site has to offer. So more reasons to care. Uh, you're helping visitors find their way with a clean, effective homepage. You're helping your organization serve its target audience and promote and enable the outcomes you want. You're increasing engagement. It's reflective of your brand. And uh, a final reason which may not always be as obvious is that a cleaner, shorter homepage is gonna be easier for your editors to maintain. Uh, the, the, the Wayfair site, 
maybe a lot of that's automated, <laughs> but somebody still has to curate those decisions and um, things can get stale and out of date. So we'll go into some, some specific examples of, of, of that. So let's go into the next section, which is where home pages go wrong. So we know a good home page is like a well-designed room, or at least that's what I'm sharing my opinion of. Um, it has clarity and purpose for your visitors. And we talked why we're specifically focused on the home page. So what I'd like to do now is demonstrate some of the most common ways that home pages go wrong and we're going to do that through um, looking at some monsters. So uh, we're going to talk about some of these problems, like too much navigation, too much page content, uh, losing sight of who the site is for, not clear who you are, not clear what to do next. All right, so our first monster I'll call the huge nav monster. So, so many redesign projects that we get as an agency, and maybe you've experienced this too, one of the primary talking points when we get uh, asked to consider redesign is people are having a bad time finding what they need. A bad user experience, the site navigation, the people can't find their way. And why is that? Well, there's many reasons, but one is maybe it's too long. Maybe you're trying to do too much with a single navigation. Maybe it's too focused on your internal audience and not outcomes for your target audience. So if you remember, of course, this example from the Wayfair site, where we've got extremely long and varied choices of navigation. Um, going to a specific client example of ours. So this is where they started. And, and if you look at the navigation, it's not overly long. Uh, in terms of numbers, we've got six main links there. Uh, however, there's a few major issues there. The first was that if you happen to click on one of them, <laughs> you were uh, completely, uh, your eyes would melt because there would be so much for you to look at and so many choices. So that's one issue. Another issue is perhaps the terms that were being used didn't quite resonate with the user. So if I'm coming to the site, I might be thinking uh, of a specific action or area as opposed to thinking business, government, services. So um, what we did here, we kept some of that, as you'll see here in the re redesign navigation. But what we did is we introduced a few things that were more plain language and more what getting at what the target audience needed. So things to do in the city. Getting around was about transportation. So starting to introduce more plain language was part of that. And then another part was reducing choice. And that sounds mean, but it's just about helping our users. So we have this drop down uh, for services. We don't have to show everything, right? We can just show what we think are, and we know from analytics, what's people, what are people looking for? Let's focus on those core things. If they want to learn more, they've got a little option there to, to click out into additional levels. Or they always have the option to view all, but we don't try to you know, overwhelm them at first. We offer them a curated view. So taming the huge navigation monster, uh, I think as a general practice, you might have heard this before, but four to six main navigation items is a, is a great number. So four seems maybe a bit short, but uh, also think of screen sizes and if you can have a shorter navigation that fits even on smaller size screens, that's gonna be better for your users. Um, you can hide everything behind a little hamburger menu, which looks great, although user experience researchers suggest that that's not always the best for your audience. They like to see what's available right from the beginning. So we can limit the drop down menus. We don't have to include everything under under the and the kitchen sink. We can have a shorter secondary navigation, which is typically in that upper right area. And again, don't try and do everything with one nav. All right. So our second monster, the giant content monster. So this monster appears when you're not sure where content belongs. So you put it all on the homepage. Or when there's different departments 
are people in your organization and they all think their content is the most important and, and they want to make sure everyone sees it. So put it all on the homepage. And the homepage grows and grows until it's a giant Godzilla. So, um, uh, so looking at one example here, <laughs> uh, no offense to anyone here. Um, so um, <laughs> this is a site that we, we, we consulted on and um, great, great service, great uh, uh, helping state residents look for, for jobs, careers. And if you look at this at, at a glance, you think, okay, the, the primary navigation, only three items, great, that's not too much. Secondary nav, maybe the wording's a little long, but not too long up here at the top. We've got our search. But then where we get things start to go awry is where do we start? So we, 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 we start scrolling down the page here on, on the left side of the screen, you telling me to do a job search, okay. And then, oh, by the, you know, do you wanna, have a caring career, great. And then what about choosing a path? And then there's three different callouts that are new topics. Then we've got upcoming events, ways to filter them. There's different dates. Scrolling down more, we got careers. And then again, there's ways to filter. All very helpful ideas. But uh, then we've got a couple training programs. Not just two, by the way. These are all scrollable, so you can have even more. Then we've got another call out. As you can see here, I don't need to labor it, but then you go down and then, oh, by the way, have you heard about our blog? And, and speaking of blogs, have you read our news? And then, um, and then there's all this links at the bottom. So all good intention content, but the overwhelming, fe the feeling when you take it all in is, at once is you might feel overwhelmed or you might more realistically just ignore it and then why even have it, right? So the opposite of the, the anti, content monster might be this page where all you've got is hey search <laughs> that's it so equally dangerous you want to find a balance between the two so how do you stop feeding the giant content monster focus on your primary users take that hard step of limiting the prime message to a single audience so that's super hard and it's always a struggle when we bring this up doing content strategy and planning is how can we possibly focus on a single audience when we have so many stakeholders. And it's not easy and, and, and it's gonna be a challenge, but if you can really narrow that down for your primary messaging, and then you still have a few secondary options to guide those other users, and you make sure you're addressing them, but, um, Another thing is avoid when you can using things like sliders and tabs. People think, oh, I don't need to decide on my primary audience. I can just have a slider and each slide is a different audience. People don't use those. They don't look at them. You might, uh, you can avoid things like embedding social media feeds on your site. People are, are, are uh, consuming those on social media. Not, they're not coming to your site to, to read them. It should be the other way around that should be directing them to your homepage to do something that they can't do on social media. And um, consider the value of news and blogs. You know, I will say, like we have a blog post, a blog on our agency site. I know that that's, that has a limited audience and if someone's coming to our site, I want to speak to them, the people looking to, who need our primary services. I, I'm not gonna assume that they're there to read my blog post even though I want them to. Uh, and, and so it's a little bit, you know, maybe a little ding to your ego, but just accept that that's not why most people are coming. All right. So a third of our six monsters, the lost monster. So what is this? Uh, forgetting who your audience is, uh, who, who the site is for. So it's very common to find sites in large organizations where the navigation and content, as I mentioned earlier, is written more for your internal audience and not the people you serve. So remember, the site is for your end users. If you want the site to be for both, and then uh, consider doing an intranet or moving some of that content off to a different site. So here's a sort of a example I just I found on the internet where you go to this site and it says, here's some popular agencies. And okay, 
and it shows a bunch of logos. I'm going to guess that these logos mean absolutely nothing to anyone, and uh, except the people who work there. And um, if I'm a user, I'm looking for a service, not not a logo of some company. So if I go to a, a different state, you know, not everything's perfect here, but at least it's speaking a bit more directly to me that I need driver services. I have health issues. I have taxes issues. There's a little image to kind of give some visual context. There's a short explanation, and I think it's a little bit more relatable and, and understandable where you want me to go. All right, so taming the lost audience monster, remembering who your site is for in the first place, what their goals are, and revisit this periodically because that can change, it often does change. Maybe there's different people on your team now that weren't there when those initial decisions were made and they lose sight of why the site is the way it is and so they feel free to change it. Change is okay, but understand, have that documentation perhaps and revisit it periodically to understand, remember what your audience is looking for, look at things like analytics, uh, uh, using plain language, avoiding using uh, con organizing content maybe by your internal departments and thinking more in terms of what your audience needs. All right, uh, number four, the faceless monster. So what is this? Outside of a logo on the upper left, does the homepage say anything about who you are? Uh, or does it stand out from any other page on your site? So homepage should be visually distinct from every other page in your site. It should be obvious that this is a special page. And it should, in my opinion, say quickly who you are and what steps you can take next. It's the front door for your site. So remember, we're not running an antique store or a grocery store. We want to be more like that sleek coffee shop uh, when, when it's ever possible. So here's an example of, of a home page on your left for a site and uh, an internal page for the site on, on your right. So. You know, there's a few cl clues here that tell me that this is a special page. Um, it's it's really uh, focused on, <clears throat> excuse me, a few action items here on your left. It, it's saying, here's who we are, and, and you're orienting you to where you've just landed, and giving you just a few choices there. And then if you go further into the site, then you can see you're a little more visually different. We've got things like uh, deeper navigation available, contact information, what have you. So if you look at another site, um, whether the home page is on the left and an internal page on, is on the right, they're, they're getting there. And some of these elements here on the left are very similar to what I showed on the previous slide. But I would argue it's not quite enough that there's, there's still so much similarity between the two that that as a distinct and unique homepage, which again is that anchor for your users to know, here's where I'm starting from. It's not as visually obvious. So what ways could we make that more distinct? Um, it also should have a clear message on who you are and what you do, in, in, and it should be short. So in this example, uh, you know, communicating, here's, here's what we do. It's just a sentence a sentence and then, and then, and then a, a subtext sentence. So don't assume users know your brand or your mission. And, and remember that people are scanning. They want to so make this quick. Uh, it doesn't mean to say, welcome to my site, because that doesn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> still, still see that quite often. And you want to emphasize the unique value, if you can, in a short phrase. Um, and have the imagery uh, back up the brand as well. So in this example, looking at the previous iteration of, this, of, the, of the site, um, this is one we worked on, this is not a bad page, it's fine, but if you look at it, you've got, you know, who am I? The, it, in, instead, it, it, does, it doesn't say that, it just says here's, a, here's the latest news item, and then you've got some call-outs here on, uh, from, on the right column. Um, so maybe in some occasion there's a, it, it's possible you can just assume people know, but I, I think there's nothing wrong with always having that initial here's who we are statement. Um, it's great for search engines, it's great for people. 
Again, it's all about emphasizing the, the unique value of your site in that home page. So in another example, uh, where uh, a site we recently launched where, um, again, we're, we're, we're giving that intro statement and uh, orienting the user to where they are, and then keeping the number of options here in the first screen that loads to a minimum. And, it, and um, it's also important to offer sample of the content that your site offers, but not too much. So the site does a lot. So it's not as easy as just saying, here's one thing we do. We want it to emphasize more, but how can we do that in a more controlled way? So we, we were able to identify these four buckets, if you will, and give people an idea by scanning and looking at the photo and, and the little buttons. Oh, and the short summaries. Here's what the site has for me. Is this what I want? And it's hinting at the content to come as opposed to putting it all on the home page. So the faceless monster, how to chase it away. A visually distinct home page is important. A clear statement, short statement about who you are and what you do, and include that small amount of sample content. Um, all right. I think this is my last one, the maze monster. So does your homepage make it clear where to go next and offer clear paths on the next step? So here's an example of a site where, uh, a site that we're currently working on, where you know you look at the, the what loads on the homepage and you think, okay, what's my clear next step? And you might say, oh, it's, it's this, request a transcript, right? But that's just one of many rotating slides and, and then, of course, as you see here, you've got three different levels of navigation. And so I think what users were finding is they didn't know where to begin, right? So I'm picking on this one, but um, uh, it, it, will, it will get better. Um, and uh, uh, so here's another example of, of a site where, um, again, you're oriented quickly, here's what we do, here's who we are, here's what we do, and then big as clear as day, start the legal guide. You can see there's a hint of additional content to be found, that's important, you don't want people to, to miss that there's additional content and think that's the end of the page. And of course that can vary on, on the size of your screen, but the primary purpose we took a, we took a stand on as a, as a team and with the client and uh, I think as for users, that just made a big difference. So the previous version of that site, again, wasn't bad. The primary call to action, I think here is search, which again, it's fine. It's got lots of, if you scroll down, it's got lots of topics. It's a, it's a content heavy site. So those are not always the easiest to make simple, but it's a clear call to action. Here's what we have to offer. That, that was kind of missing. Um, so, how to escape the maze monster? Try to have that primary call to action. Limit the amount of choice or decision making on the home page. Again, we're not we're not limiting it site wide, and offer a clear path. So, a few more monsters to cover uh, briefly: uh, where home pages go wrong, a lack of governance. Does your organization have training and documentation on how to use content on the web? Um, is anyone measuring what's effective? Do you know? what areas of your homepage people are looking at and what areas they're engaging with and can you make adjustments from there. Um, voices in the shadows, that refers to um, maybe someone that was not involved in the project but has decision-making power and comes in later in the design process after you've defined these are our primary calls to action, this is our primary content, and says, no, no, it's got to have this thing. And they don't have the context of the conversations that we've been having, and but they have power, and so this is not uncommon, and then boom, we added another two, three sections to the home page, right? And so that's how you start getting out of control, even from the best intentions. Um, lack of feedback loops. So it depends on your organization, but if you're not selling a product, you may not, if you're more like, let's say, a government service, you may not have 
that immediate feedback loop in, uh, in terms of products sold. So what other ways are you able to tell how effective your site is? Are you, have you tried doing user testing? Have you offer ways for people to engage with the page to say, is this effective? Uh, or submit their own feedback. And uh, have a measurement of what is success. What is the, is the time spent on the site this measure of success? I always like to revisit this one because uh, a lesson learned early in my career was we redesigned a city website and we were noticing the time spent on the page was going down. Is that a bad thing? Is it because people are uninterested or is it because now they can actually find what they want without staring at the screen for 20 seconds? And so you don't know just from looking at pure data. So you're going to have to ask people, maybe do some user testing. Um, all right, so let's recap what we learned and add a few more pointers and do great on time. So again, what makes it good? A good homepage, visually distinct, who you are and what you do. Give some samples of content. Don't assume your users know what you're doing, what you offer. Give them a sample. Um, calls to action next step and keeping it simple. Uh, some other things not to do. Load slowly. If it takes a few more seconds to load, people are going to leave. And that, the more content heavy your site is, the more sliders it has and, and you know, uh, Instagram feeds, that's all going to impact your performance. It's going to wait on that home page and drive users away. You want to follow standard layouts. And what I mean by that is there's some established uh, norms in today's web, such as your logo in the upper left, search in the upper right. It, you don't always want to have to be boring and predictable, but there's a few key areas where it's just going to be less for your users to worry about and have to cognitively process. So. Um, it's just going to be easier for them. Uh, if you do have to use video, try to avoid autoplay video. There's accessibility issues with that as well as performance issues. And uh, if you do have animation beyond some micro things, uh, look for ways to include options for people to pause uh, so that um, it can be accessible. Uh, one topic that uh, comes up when you're thinking about a home page and really any important page on a website is something called the fold. So um, real quick, just in case you're not familiar with the term, you probably have heard it though, um, goes back to newspapers. I got a printed newspaper up until three, four years ago, I think. Um, it's where the, the, the page folds in half and everything above that fold is, is, is the primary on the home page of a, of a newspaper is, is, is the main focus. So the same with the website and what loads in that first available screen. And users do scroll. That is a behavior that we as a society are learning to do more and more, um, but not entirely. Um, so as recent as, well, in 2010, study showed 80% of people did not scroll. And the more recent study, that's dropped to about 50%. So I definitely scroll, <laughs> but not everyone does. And there's also a limit to how far, how far someone's willing to scroll and whether it's valuable to them. So knowing that, we still need to remember to put our most important content at the top of the page. That's an easier thing to do when you're limiting the amount of content on the home page and having a primary call to action. You want to guide users down the page if you need to, and you want to avoid what's called a false floor, which I sort of hinted at earlier. If people think this is the end of your page, they're not going to scroll down. So if you had like a full, full uh, window of video and no hint that there was more content below, people might not scroll. So in our own research, we have found that um, through some looking at heat maps studies, that users don't scroll to the bottom of the page very often. All right, so let's bring it all home, making the case for simplicity. Assuming you agree homepage is critical to your organization's success, what do you do next? So maintaining a good home, you could start with, again, with a heat map test, like something like Crazy Egg uh, is one that we use a lot. I should have uh, not had my, there we go, turn off my alerts. <laughs> Uh, which I'll show uh, a quick example of here. So 
uh, when we are working on a, a site, this gives you uh, uh, an indication of where users are, are moving their cursors and clicking. You can see in this example, everyone was ignoring the big news story. <laughs> um, people were interested in services, and so there's some lessons we could take from this. It also will tell you things like where people are trying to click and there's actually not an option. Um, Sitemap testing. So another great practice, we use a tool that uh, we call TreeJack. I think maybe the name is officially changed, but you can set up and run tests of the site navigation and observe how well users are navigating and finding the things that you hope they can find. So in that example, you get results where we can see this was our destination. When we asked this question of users, how did they do? And we can see, oh, this was a success. Sure, a few outliers went off to some different areas, but the primary bulk of users followed the path. So then that gave us the feedback to know we were on the right track. Um, and of course, review site, site analytics, to see how people are engaging with your site. And a um, few uh, last thoughts. Personalization is uh, always a hot topic, and I think it has some promise and, and worth exploring in this area for home pages. Uh, in that case, you don't have to maybe, if you could not have to decide out of your five audiences which one you were focused on, if you could actually serve up the page, depending on who's looking at it, that's the dream. Of course, the reality is that we still have things like we have to very real and, and important privacy concerns that will perhaps block some of those things, but it has some promise in, 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 in what it might offer in terms of refining your homepage experience. Also remember, it doesn't have to be the homepage. You can have targeted landing pages if you have something that you're really promoting, like, I don't know, free college program. Um, it doesn't have to be on the homepage. You have a different page and, and drive traffic to that. Um, and then lastly, I have AI on there, uh, really just to say that I mentioned AI. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we made it through, and hopefully I've given you all uh, some new ways to think about effective homepages, some tips on to make your homepage better, and strategies to avoid common monsters and concerns. All right, uh, and with that, I'm done, and I will take your questions. Thanks a lot. Question in the front. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm in house at a government agency, so when I say client, it's the people above me in the mm. hierarchy. Uh, when do you know? Uh, when do you know when to give in and give up? When the client says, "Oh, we have to have this on the home page." Yes. You really should yes. I I don't know uh, I, 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 uh, if this works for everyone, but I will tell you one little strategy um uh and if, if hopefully no bosses are listening <laughs> sometimes getting an outside voice opens those doors better right and so sometimes just the act of working with an outside agency uh who maybe have been doing this for 20 plus years and hundreds of websites uh as they should have some experience there but sometimes that just carries more weight honestly than than you uh, in internal staff. It's, it's not fair, but it's just reality. And so that's one strategy. Uh, the real, And the other th truth is sometimes you don't win the battles. Um, but the more you know and the more you can present, uh, share this slide, this video of them uh, with them, uh, making the case. And, and yeah, from there, it's just do the best you can to, to serve your, your external audience. Uh, yes? Yeah, with the, the full, this is a full question. Uh, you mentioned a couple of statistics. When was the recent one? Uh, yes, good question. Uh, the most recent study about that I looked at on how many times users were scrolling, this was 2021. Follow-up question. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, with your experience, I find, like, so, like, working at the university, there's a range of ages that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that younger people scroll more and older people scroll uh, less or yeah so the question is do you does the scrolling behavior vary by demographics and 
I don't have the answer to that because I don't think the stats that I looked at were, were broken out by demographic groups. Intuitively, that sounds correct. I know that mobile users uh, are clearly more used to scrolling, and so if you were to make that leap to say younger mobile, yes. Um, but it is surprising anytime we do a study and we do those heat map tracking on mobile devices as well as desktop and you still see those patterns. So I wish it were not so, but knowing our reality, we kind of plan ahead. And, and I think ultimately everyone served whether they scroll or not to have the, the main point at the top. So, uh, yes? Related question, does, it, does the number of a stat for how many people scroll vary dramatically once they're off the home page? Mm. You gotta think like you just arrived on this brand new site. Of course, you're looking at the navigation. Yep. You're probably not gonna scroll, but did, did you find people scrolling more often than sub pages? Yes. So, do people does the scrolling behavior change once you're further into the site and per page? Yes, of course. Uh, it, if you're there to look, read about, uh, um, I don't know, licensing laws for opening a business, you have to read the content. So you're gonna have to scroll, right? But if you're on a landing page and you're trying to decide that first step, no. Um, and the best you can do from there is, is you just run a test and on a page in question and, and make adjustments from there. Because clearly some content is not gonna fit, you know, it's gonna, it has to be long, it has to be scrolled. Uh, but uh, yeah, question here? One of my beef, big beefs about a lot of websites is- Is it the two long titles? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, that, that I've already mentioned. So, uh, on the front page, there's so many of them, it's very difficult to find uh, contact information. And I tend to, you know, if I want to look for it, I scroll down to the yes. footer to see if that is. But yes. there's so many that, you know, like where contact information is important for something like, you know, if you're looking up health insurance, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, <laughs> and it almost seems like these businesses don't want to provide <laughs> I think so the question is 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 getting at contact information and and whether how, how, how easily to how it. to get it and the commonly accepted practice is to put some contact links in the footer of your site that's mm -hmm. just a sort of a best industry standard right mm -hmm. as to whether there's an insurance company that actually wants you uh, to call them <laughs> Probably not. That is that I, I would feel very comfortable saying that is deliberate. You know, I was trying to contact Amazon about some damaged package and you know, they kept saying, Well use our, our chat bot and, and it's like, Well I want to talk to an agent. Whoa, what do you want to talk about? Oh, well this thing. Well then here's some solutions. It's like, no, I want to talk to an agent. So yes, that that is deliberate. Um, I as it relates to this talk, I would just say you know, follow best practices in terms of making predictable patterns. Have your contact information in the footer because that's where people are looking. And from there, if that's the primary thing you want people to do, put it at the top. Generally speaking, most organizations, that's not the, pri not even for evil reasons, but they, that's not the primary thing they want you to do. Yeah. So, so that would be a, a secondary concern. Yeah. I can um, a little bit more to that actually. Yeah. Yeah, as, as a representative of a giant evil corporation who I won't name, um, you lose attribution as soon as they pick up the phone. So like all the all the information we store about them in cookies and stuff like that, it's all go, go as soon as they call us. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so there's some tracking information. Apologies if I'm not, do it, not doing these in order, but uh, I'll start in the back. Do you have any insight on best practices for using video in the hero space on a home page? Best practice for using video in the hero space. I would say, my in my opinion, and I know uh, some of my colleagues would share this, you know, you really want to keep an eye on performance and nothing's going to kill performance of a page more than, than video, well, maybe some things, but that's one of the top. And so if it's, if you have a fairly light site of content, like we're selling, you know, designer shirts or something, and that's part of your brand to, to share that, then you know, give it a try because some of those sites can be fairly minimal for content. But if I'm there to get a driver's license or whatever, I don't need to see video, right? Get me to the point. So consider your audience, consider how much content you're trying to, and, and what value it brings to your brand. Does it really add value? And if not, I would say make it secondary or, or just 
pull it off that home page so that everything moves quickly. Uh, yeah, right there. Um, I have a question about, um, so the, like, on your home page, you're wanting to put the things that people are looking for. Um, how do you balance that with things that you want to promote and, like, let people know that you So the question is, you have your primary, let's say, organization's message and point that's, like, evergreen, and then you've got like something special that you're trying to promote. Is that one way of, with that how you'd phrase it? Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, I will admit to that. So the way I would probably address that is I would keep my primary uh, message and point always still visible, but, but in that little space or secondary content you could work in a, t a more timely message or perhaps use a banner a small banner across the top of the page drawing people's attention it is going to compete for attention so you're going to have to make that calculation whether it's worth it or not if that makes sense um yes talk a little bit about um feedback and um, going back to objectives for, for the home page. Mm -hmm. um, could you share a little bit about um, how tweaks and ongoing enhancements, that the, the extent of which um, making tweaks and improvements um, help toward, toward that, that objective uh, beyond the initial redesign? So using, looking at, at gathering user feedback and then utilizing that and seeing what adjustments will will improve the site yeah and, and just how, how important is it to to be open to tweaks and, and changes how important is it to be open to tweaks and changes it's very important uh, web pages should websites should never are living breathing things they are they're never done we're even the best professional team or uh, on internal or external there's always a degree of we're, we're making our best educated guesses. And we really don't know until you put it out in the wild. So you should always plan for that. If you, uh, We always tell clients, if you have a project budget, have a budget for after launch so that you can do things like when you're looking at how people are actually using it in the, in the real world and then making adjustments, you can do things like you could test out A-B testing. Like what if we make this change to the homepage and, and have this different message? What effect does that have on, on our, our user journey? Um, so it's really about making sure, I, my short answer is have that budget for the project, have an ongoing budget, ideally equally equal to that, that you can continually uh, test and improve. Uh, How many you, do you have solutions? So our heat maps also show that no one gets to the footer, like almost no one gets to the footer. Yeah. So I have been telling clients that the Twitter is basically infinite space. If you really want something on a page, like <laughs> so a giant awful menu from the top to the bottom. And and so like if if it's people who do control F or they're desperate, like they'll find it. What do you think of that? <laughs> it's an interesting approach. So, so he what he's saying, if you couldn't hear, is is hey, people aren't if people aren't scrolling the footer, can we just shove everything down there? And um, I think I think that there's it's a little it's a little evil of you to suggest, but um, <laughs> but I, I I appreciate it, and I think I would say as long as it's text, it's not going to affect the load time. Um, if you're trying to shove like you know pulling in data from blog posts and news items, then that's just going to hit your performance and you might as well not do it. Um, I never personally, yeah, if you want to add like a more extensive navigation, because we know even though there's always the option to search or navigate, people, I don't know what the percentage split is, but some people love to search. Some people love to peck through navigation. I'm actually with the peck through navigation type. So, uh, uh, or search is ineffective. So yeah, if you wanted to include a more extensive navigation in the footer and keep your primary at the top more simple, I think that's that's a, a, a pretty good idea. Yeah, uh, next to you. Yeah, so I have two questions. So my first one would be, um, what is your suggestion on how frequently you should be updating and changing stuff on the home page? Because obviously for returning users, um, you know, they want that consistency and familiarity. Yeah. But also to keep things fresh, 
what's the best um, yeah so the the question is about how often should you be updating your home page and keeping it fresh so I hear this a lot, and I, I would say there's a couple of thoughts here, and uh, this will be the last question I can take for today, and then uh, I'll stick around for other questions. Um, a lot of times that, that comment about keeping it fresh comes from an internal team member, mm -hmm. and the reality is the external world isn't coming to your homepage that often. You are, because you work there, but the external person is there because they need to be and they're looking for something and they don't really care uh, that you know you have the latest blog post or whatever like they're there for that primary call to action there are obviously cases where that does matter more I mean if you're running a news site you got to keep that content fresh if you're running a, a, a store you want to keep your your offerings but I think for for the the organizations that um, that we're used to working with, I'd say, yeah, don't get caught in that trap of, of worrying about it because the reality is um, people aren't there for that. They're there for whatever primary content or purpose you have. All right, so thanks again, and uh, I'll be around for more questions.